I want to talk to you about how problems from thousands of years ago still echo today. This is also the story of how I ended up partially bringing an XKCD comic to life. If you're not familiar with XKCD comics, it was created by a former NASA engineer, and so the humor tends to be a little bit towards STEM. Lots of math, engineering, science involved. Well, in 2009, XKCD posted a strip entitled Apocalypse, and it starts out as you might expect where we see that the skies burn, the seas turn to blood, and the dead walk the earth. Now, I wish to assure you, I did not cause any of those things, nor did mathematicians, although, of course, some calculus students might disagree. But I do fit into the, the strip, and we'll see how later on, because there's more to it. But for now, we need to start with our story, and of course, with any good story involving the apocalypse, we should go back to ancient Egypt where we meet the Rhine Papyrus. Now this is the oldest existing mathematical document. And it gives us a good insight into how in ancient Egypt they did mathematics. You know, what were they doing? What problems were they looking at? How did they solve them? And one of the things that we discover is they had a really unusual way of looking at fractions. You see, they like a very particular type of fractions. So in other words, they like fractions which had a one upstairs. Things like 1 over 7, 1 over 137, 1 over 16, 19. These were great fractions, the kind that they liked. But there were also, of course, bad fractions. And that was if there wasn't a 1 upstairs. 4 over 7, 9 over 29, 5 over 111, forget it. Terrible, terrible. We don't like those kinds. You might think, wow, so you're saying in ancient Egypt there was never a 4 sevenths? Well, no. They just chose to work with it in a different way. So what would they do? Well, they would say, look, I'll take something which I don't like, like 4 over 7, and rewrite it as combinations of things that I do like. So in this case, 1 over 2 and 1 over 14. Now, there's lots of questions we can ask. The first one, why? Why would they do this? And uh, some modern mathematicians have come to the conclusion that they made a mistake. Well, it does seem like a very inconvenient system. But even if it's a mistake, we can also still ask other questions. For example, the first question you might ask, is this even possible? And we can answer that if we leap ahead a few thousand years by using the work of Leonardo de Pisa, also known as Fibonacci. Now, he wrote a wonderful book called Liber Abaci, which said, look, math belongs to the people. And everybody can do mathematics. And this book revolutionized the world. And of course, he's probably most famous for his numbers, the Fibonacci numbers, which start 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so forth, which is really based off of essentially a homework problem, counting the number of rabbits, which are on an island, where the rabbits breed like, well, like rabbits. And so how many rabbits are there? And uh, one of the things he looked at, he said, look, these Egyptian fractions, you can always make any fraction and rewrite it as a sum of these Egyptian fractions, where there's a one upstairs. And how do you do it? Well, the answer is you should be greedy. Now, when we talk about being greedy, it means find the biggest fraction that's of the right type that you can and start there. So, for instance, if I start with 9 over 29 and say, well, what's the biggest fraction with the one upstairs? It's 1 over 4. That's, that's the biggest one right below 9 over 29. Say, so, okay, oh, great. So 9 over 29, 1 over 4, plus 7 over 116. Well, we're not done yet, but we seem like we're closer, right? Because 7 is smaller than 9. Repeat. And then you can replace that 7 over 116 with 1 over 17 and 3 over 1972. <sighs> Doing better. Repeat. And if you do it one more time, that 3 over 1972, 1 over 658 plus 1, over 648,788, done, done. Of course, you can see it gets a little bit unwieldy. Now you might say, great, we're done, right? Nothing more to say on the subject. Well, hold on. Now if we sort of put on our sort of philosopher's hat and say, look, maybe it's not good to be greedy. In fact, there are times when greed is not good. So you can take that same fraction, nine over 29, and write it in a simpler format. For, so, for example, 1 over 6 
plus 1 over 7, plus 1 over 12, 18. And now we see, okay, well, so maybe greed isn't always good, but what's possible, what's not possible, what can we do? These are great questions to ask. And there have been many such questions raised, which helps leap us forward to more modern times into the 20th century, where we meet our next two story characters. The first one, Paul Erdős. He was born in 1913 in uh, Hungary. His parents were mathematicians, and he was a child prodigy, an amazing mathematician. And if you think about what an eccentric mathematician might be, visualize that in your head, if you will. Now turn that up to an 11, and you're getting close to what Paul Erdős was. He loved math to the nth degree, constantly on the road for most of his life, living out of two suitcases, going from collaborator to collaborator, knocking on the door. My mind is open. I want to do math. And once he'd mentally exhausted them, on to the next place. And uh, brilliant, brilliant person, uh, but really basically only did math to the extent where Everybody else needed to help him take care of other issues. Now, the next person, Ron Graham. He was born in 1935 and uh, grew up in uh, a lot of places. He actually traveled quite a lot when he was young. But he was very different. He was very athletic. He did uh, acrobatics. He did juggling. He was a showman, outgoing, charismatic, also a great mathematician. And if you were to look at these two side by side, you would say they have almost nothing in common. But there was something they had in common. And that was they both were very interested in problems involving Egyptian fractions. And indeed, when they started first meeting, that was what they would talk about, Egyptian fractions. And they met in the 1960s and collaborated for decades. And uh, Ron and Paul were very good friends. Indeed, Ron took over the accounting for Paul. And this is the actual accounting book where Ron would keep track of all the money. He'd take it in, take it out, so forth and so on. And they worked on many, many problems together. They ended up publishing 30 papers, but uh, they worked on even more problems, some of which did not get finished before Paul passed away. But Ron wanted to finish those problems. And so, a few decades later, I got to meet Ron and work with him. And we became good friends. And uh, this is a picture of me and, and Ron. I'm the one on the right, in case you're wondering. And uh, Ron said, look, I have a paper, a problem, that I started with, with Paul Erdős. I want to finish it. So we got together, and we got to work on it. And we were able to use modern tools to help fill in the last few steps and finally solve the problem that they had started decades earlier. And this resulted in a paper. So it's about Egyptian fractions, where the denominators have a very particular form. In particular, they consisted of three prime numbers multiplied together. And the question was, well, can you always write a whole number, like one, two, three, so forth and so on, as some combination of these? And the answer is, yes, you can. Yes, you can. It's always possible. Now. What does all this have to do with the apocalypse? Right? We seem to have been going for quite a while. Well, to understand that, we have to talk about the Erdős numbers. Now, an Erdős number measures how far you are from Erdős, and in, where the distance is based on number of papers. So let's take uh, someone, Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein wrote a paper with Ernst Strauss. Ernst Strauss wrote a paper with Paul Erdős, so that was two steps away. It's kind of like the Kevin Bacon number, but for mathematicians. And so your Erdős number was, how many steps are you away? And the smaller your Erdős number, the closer you were to Erdős in some sense. So there were over 10,000 people have an Erdős number of two, but 512 people have an Erdős number of one. And I'm number 512 on that list. The last person to get the coveted Erdős number of one. And so, now we can return to our XKCD comic. Remember that the dead were out and about, walking the earth. And we see that, aha, a mathematician upon hearing this news 
goes and does what a mathematician would normally do. More math. And so they work furiously, find a great result, and then off to the graveside of Paul Erdős, where we see Paul rising from the dead. Paul Erdős, they ask. Yes, we need you to sign this because they want to get that coveted Erdős number of one, even though he had passed away. Well, I was able to do it. Almost 20 years after Erdős passed away, I was able to get that Erdős number of one. Now you might ask the question, well, okay, great. So this must be the end, right? Well, as with many questions, once you solve one problem, three or four rise up to take its place. And there's always more to do, more to do.